Welcome to our free Life Coach Certification. We will be running this for free while we are under the COVID-19 lockdown. We hope that you will take advantage of this opportunity to expand your horizons during these unprecedented times. Stay tuned to the end so that we can send you your credits and official certification. We've given you complete control so you can work through the course at your own pace. Just remember, you must apply for your certification before the COVID-19 restrictions are lifted. If you're attending this class, there are some things we know about you. You are the kind of person who likes to help others. You have a sense that there is more going on in this life than meets the eye. You have a desire to live in a better world. And there's a good chance that you are an empath. It's likely that you are already a life coach. That is to say that people are already drawn to you to seek you out for advice. What does that tell you? You already have a calling. And being a life coach is part of your sacred destiny. We're here today to help empower you in your gifts and talents and to activate your ability to help make the world a better place. This is our gift to you from your friends at St. Paul's Free University. It's our hope that as a life coach you can live a better life your best life, and make the world a better place as you reach out to help others achieve their highest and best after the cloud of this pandemic has lifted. Enjoy the class. Here to share with us today is St. Paul's Free University's own specialist in the area of intuition. Amy Elmore is a Reiki practitioner, an intuitive reader, and today she's going to share with you how intuition can be highly effective in supporting your work as a personal life coach. Amy's talks are always full of valuable data as she is also a writer and research specialist. So be prepared to take notes as Amy shares with us intuitiveness as a skill set, how to use intuition as a coaching tool. Amy Elmore. Um, good morning, my name is Amy. I'm a Reiki uh, practitioner and uh, also intuitive reader. Before I launch into my talk though about intuition, um, I just want to give a quick thank you to um, St. Paul's Free University for putting on this event. Um, I'm sure um, you guys will enjoy today. I always do enjoy our events. Also, I'm really excited to see so many people here sign up to be my coaches. Um, I've seen this field grow over the past few years, and I think it's going to just continue to grow um, as time goes on since like the 90s. Also, um, you know, I look forward to uh, also listening to uh, the other speakers, uh, Wendy, David, and Daniel. Um, they always put a lot of preparation and thought into their uh, presentations, so I also look forward to listening to what they have to say today, too. So anyway, as the title says, um, you know, my uh, presentation, sorry about that technology, um, is we'll be talking about intuition and how to uh, use it as a uh, skill for um, coaching. Now, <clears throat> intuition can be a valuable asset that protects us and keeps us safe uh, when we're feeling most vulnerable. And perhaps you didn't know, though, that it could be a useful skill to have in business as well. Um, when we have a career business, such as life coaching, that brings us face-to-face with our clients or one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, we may not think that intuition uh, would be a good skill to have or use or a tool that benefits both us and our client. Um, we know that empathy, as David said, um, and compassion are important to have in life coaching and uh, a good, you know, soft skill to have. But um, intuition can really help us in our business decisions and management, uh, marketing plans, and also being able to market to and find our uh, ideal clients um, that we can you know, best serve with our unique skills that we have. Uh, so by sharpening our intuition, <clears throat> we have the ability to really connect with our clients and um, their needs and uh, help them with their goals and uh, really reach, you know, reach and, and help them succeed. 
which is, you know, a life coach's goal is to, you know, watch our clients reach their dreams. So what exactly is intuition though and how do we define that? If you do a quick internet search, you'll see that psychology defines it as um, an ability to acquire knowledge without inference or the use of reason, which many of us, if you think of logic and reason, we think of Mr. Spock, who's all about logic and reason. <laughs> And uh, you know the science officer who's you know second in command. Now, how many of you are familiar with the Myers Briggs personality test? Okay. So, you know, for some of you, maybe you've seen the memes of the different personality types on the internet. There's a couple examples, and here's the uh, the list full list. Um, Myers Briggs, how they define intuition is. Uh, an awareness of knowing that seems uh, to come unbidden and cannot be logically explained. And uh, for some of you that may not be familiar, uh, the letters, um, what they stand for is the uh, E stands for extrovert, the I stands for introvert. So it's testing these polar opposites to see where you fit in. So the S is for sensing, the I is for intuition, T is for thinking, F is for feeling, J is judging, and P is perceiving. Went too far, sorry. Spoiler alert. Um, so the medical definition for um, intuition is non-rational cognition, assumed knowledge, guesswork, or a hunch, which explains Captain Kirk, who, as we know, often goes off hunches besides logic and reason, but mostly hunches. Um, I think what this shows is that in leadership roles, you know, we don't need just need logic and reason, uh, but also compassion and intuition that makes the best leaders. That's why Captain Kirk is captain and Spock is <laughs> second in command. So if we move away from main science and into main or uh, away from mainstream and into metaphysical, um, they describe intuition as a natural knowing capacity. Uh, inner knowing, immediate apprehension of spiritual truth without resort or intellectual means or wisdom of the heart. So, you know, for some people they hear that as, you know, maybe hippie stuff or, you know, let's, you know, all gather around new agey stuff. So with those definitions of intuition, if it's described as knowing without logic or reason or wisdom of the heart, is it reliable? Well, in academia and in science fields such as medicine and psychology, um, they view intuition as an early development, part of, um, a part of our development at an early age um, that starts around the age three to five. And it can be affected by our environment and caretakers also by observing the behavior of others around us. So they are basically exposed to new, we tend to mimic the actions of adults and uh, other children at that age. And uh, if any of you have school age children, you probably notice as soon as they start kindergarten and preschool uh, that their behavior starts to change and they, um, they're exposed to different personalities and behaviors. Uh, some good, some bad, new ways of thinking too. So um, as my mom used to put it, the definition of brats are other people's kids. <laughs> so I think that brings us to nature versus nurture. Um, if science sees intuition as a development stage that we learn from our environment, I think this explanation of intuition really actually can be based on reason and logic. Um, it's more like instinct than Intuition, and uh, lots of people confuse those two. I'm sure you've heard of the nature versus nurture uh, debate, where you know our behavior, what does it come from, uh, why am I like you know the way I am. But um, I think the explanation of nature and nurture fits in with the development of our instincts as well, because it seems that both nature and nurture does affect our instincts. For example with nature, we have these built-in skills in, into our DNA that helps us survive as species. You know, our brain takes in loads of information at our subconscious 
uh, filters them to decide whether or not we are in danger and it keeps us safe. Uh, for example, if you've ever gone for a walk in the woods and all of a sudden you feel nervous and you notice that it's dead quiet, um, it's probably because all the animals went quiet because there might be a predator or it might be a environmental threat like a storm coming or earthquake. So those kind of things help us uh, with our instincts. So with nurture, um, that comes from the environment of how we were raised. Uh, these conditions were raised and really helps build on nature's um, instincts. Uh, for example, if uh, you take two kids, one was raised in an area that was high crime and versus maybe someone who was raised in suburbia in safe neighborhoods, um, if they're both walking down a city street, both of them are going to be, uh, their perceptions are going to be completely and totally different. Their visual clues of what's safe and not safe are going to be different. So if they see someone who's kind of fidgety, maybe this kid from suburbia is going to get nervous, not feel safe, cross the road or find another route. But maybe the kid who was raised around that kind of thing will go uh, and assess whether that person is just, um, you know, an addict waiting for their dealer or, uh, you know, maybe someone who's just going through a hard time or, you know, they're going to know whether that person's safe or not. And they're also going to know how to act, you know, to be confident and show no fear and pass by. Um, so that example of instinct is very different from intuition. So, for example, intuition, um, how many of you have met a stranger and you just instantly connected and you were like best friends separated at birth? Or you met someone and you just knew this person, there's something off about them, I don't know what it is, but you know, they're not safe. So that's a good example of instinct. So what are the types of ways that, um, or I said intuition, sorry. Um, so what are some ways that intuition speaks to us? Um, there's seeing, hearing, you know, knowing and feeling. And um, for example, we'll have a sample question what did my husband have for lunch today? And let's say it's McDonald's. So if you have a seeing intuition, you're probably going to see, you know, the golden arches. So we'll come to mind. And uh, if you're more hearing, you'll probably like maybe hear the jingle. Uh, other ways are like songs, that kind of thing. I don't know if you know Mr. Bean. <laughs> so also another way is hearing. Oop, or I did hearing, knowing, there we go. Um, sometimes before you even finish the question, um, you just know, it, it doesn't even almost form into a word, you just know. And then there is taste and smell, which I think is pretty rare, not many people have this. So maybe you smell the french fries or taste the hamburger, you might get a sour feeling in your mouth, um, you know, you might get a scent that you, that you smell that's familiar to you. And then there's feeling, and this is often described uh, probably more familiar to people, such as you know having a gut feeling. It could also manifest as sensations in your body, such as maybe a headache, the tightness in the chest or throat, um, or even um, emotions that seem to be unexplained and come out of nowhere that don't belong to you. So intuition versus fear. Sometimes, you know, like I was talking about with those emotions, we feel fear, but how do we know it's actually intuition and fear? Because some people get those uh, confused. So, for example, well, intuition, for one, um, is that tapping on the shoulder, and it doesn't really have an emotion attached to it. And like Dave was bringing up earlier, yeah, uh, sometimes you can feel other people's emotions. So sometimes you have to decipher between what's yours and what's other people. And once you do, you still have to fight off, you know, your own insecurities. For example, you know, if you plan a vacation to go to Hawaii, you know, and you're nervous about flying on the plane and you're scared, and maybe you're like, oh, maybe this is my intuition telling me not to get on that plane. But intuition would be more of a, a strong urge to maybe change your plans or find a different way. Um, that would be more along the lines of, of intuition. Um, so, how can you um, build on your intuition if maybe some of you don't have 
uh, built-in um, intuition or maybe you want to make it stronger. There's some exercises that you can do. For example, journaling really helps. I don't know if, if any of you heard the artist way. She has a suggestion of doing uh, pages, your morning pages every day. Um, that also helps with getting in touch with your intuition because it really helps clear your brain fog and any anxieties or mind chatter, even, you know, like um, to-do list and reminders. You can kind of get that all out of the way so you can focus on the now and the present. There's also meditation that you can do. Uh, again, that helps kind of clear your mind. Um, it relaxes your body, uh, releases tension. And uh, if you're not big on meditation, there's all um, of sitting still and just trying to empty your mind. There's all kinds of guided meditations you can do on YouTube uh, that aren't that long. Um, there's also moving meditation, which is things like yoga, gar even gardening and washing dishes. As long as you're focused and relaxed in what you're doing, it's a type of, of meditation. Also, getting out and getting some fresh air to garden or hike, yard work, you know, go to the beach, the lake, really just connect with nature. Also, you can connect with your intuition by just asking it a question, such as, you know, what color is my best friend and shirt is my best friend wearing today? And then maybe text her for the answer. Um, and just with those type of things, write your first answer down. So you can almost, you know, make a game out of it and do some, you know, playing prediction, um, get a deck of cards, dice, you know, if you're in a store, you know, let your intuition guide you which line is moving faster. Um, if, the, if your phone is ringing before you pick it up, try to let it come to you who's calling you. I've done that. It's kind of fun. And then also, you know, as the Jedi say, don't think, feel. So really kind of feel your way into it. Um, if you try to overthink and overanalyze, uh, you're doing it wrong. Just kind of let it flow, really. And then after that, kind of just get out of your own way. When you start to get some confirmation of that you're getting in touch with your um, intuition, then um, don't start doubting it. Just go ahead and, and keep trusting yourself. Also, some positive self-talk. So affirmations really help to build our confidence, too. So how is all of this going to help you with your coaching? as a, a and, and business management. Um, how do you put all this together? Well, both intuition and instincts um, are equally important tools and they're practical uses for, you know, feeling secure and safe. For example, uh, maybe a client wants to meet, uh, meet you and you're feeling, you know, maybe I should meet in a public space or maybe I shouldn't be giving them my personal information. Maybe they're a little too you know, invasive on your personal life. So it could really help protect you, your privacy and your security as well. Also, intuition really helps you to reduce the struggle of making business decisions, especially if you're new at this and you have to worry about, um, you know, making decisions or agonizing over, you know, the minutiae details that often happens when you're, you know, going into business especially if things are just a matter of personal choice and it's not necessarily something you can look up. You know, for example, you know, which style of life coaching should I do? Should I, you know, uh, market it? Should I do word of mouth or digitally market myself? Um, these are all personal choices and I've known people who have done both. There are some really successful uh, Reiki masters that are just word of mouth and that's it. And others, um, you know, have pages uh, on social media and do really well. So it's just, um, you can use your intuition to, you know, best uh, find what your needs best serve you. Also, a being intuitive really helps you build your confidence. Once you flex and strengthen your intuitive skills, you'll learn to trust yourself and have confidence in your capabilities. So. Um, it also will help you develop compassion, as most people who are intuitive are described as highly sensitive and uh, you know, have other abilities that help them connect with their family, their friends, and their community.
So if you continue to develop your intuition, it'll only help you build on that compassion. It could also help you as a compass really find your way when you're stuck and you're unsure, you know, which direction to go to. And again, you know, turn your cans into cans. <laughs> Also, it could help you vet your um, clients. So sometimes, you know, if you're, you know, we're all going to be interviewing our clients to see whether or not we're a good fit. And sometimes someone looks good on paper, but maybe you have a feeling like, oh, maybe this person might be a little too, maybe I don't have maybe what they're looking for, maybe we're not a good fit. So it really helps that intuitiveness, you know, that gut feeling, um, you know, to see, uh, you know, if a client is going to be maybe uh, too high maintenance, for example, and um, you just don't have that kind of energy. And someone, some people do. So, also could help you with your clients once you start working with them. Um, maybe they get stuck or they're resistant and they're not wanting to try new things or make excuses. You know, you could use your intuition to figure out okay, is there some fear behind that? You know, why are they being resistant? And you could help them take baby steps. So you could really kind of just really help them further by, by tuning into what, they're, what they really need. Also, there might be a time where, um, you know, your client comes to you with a textbook problem and, you know, it's all there on paper and you're like, okay, I know I should be taking this stuff, but a step, but something feels like, you know, I think I need to think about out of the box or, you know, think uh, in terms of, uh, you know, different and, and unique ways. So that really helps to connect with people. So sometimes, you know, intuition will, oops, sorry, <laughs> way alert. So sometimes uh, intuition will really nudge uh, you out of logic and into, um, you know, out of logic and reason and into just, you know, new pathways and new ways of thinking. So um, in my own practice, I rely very much on intuition as a Reiki master or practitioner. Um, you know, you really have to be in tune with the, uh, your client, let your hands guide you, and sometimes you pick up on things, so you really have to be in touch with your intuition. Um, as an intuitive reader, um, again, you have to really rely on intuition to figure out, you know, the answers uh, to the questions that your, you know, client is coming to you with. When, it, when my client's on the table, I mean, all kinds of things from like if their chakras are out, if there's emotions or pain. So there's all kinds of ways that intuition helps me out every day. Let's see, what time is it? Um, I do have a handout, it is in your book, and it has a list of all the, um, you don't have to bring it out if you want, but it has a list of the exercises that I told you about, as well as the website for Myers-Briggs if you're interested in taking the test. Um, if you go through Myers-Briggs, uh, it does cost money, but there are other places on the internet that you can take it. I do suggest that if you can't find a certified Myers-Briggs um, practitioner, uh, just make sure that the answers, or excuse me, the, the questions should be statements and they should be strongly agree, agree, and they should be based on that. And that's how you could, that's a good way to find if it's a good test to take, the personality test. So, and I really do suggest getting, it's a great tool. Um, you really get to know yourself and also help you uh, figure out why you, what makes you tick and why you are the way you are. Um, and eventually you might want to add it into your life coaching and help your clients really get to know themselves on a deeper level. Um, and it can also help you even further insights into helping them and what makes them tick. So, all right, thank you so much. And uh, we're gonna take a little break before our next speaker. For many clients, lack of life purpose is the major roadblock standing between them and their optimum potential. Lack of a well-defined goal in life leads to lethargy, depression, aimlessness, self-destructive or reckless behaviors. Working through self-reflective process of realizing a client's unique life purpose is an invaluable technique for any practicing life coach. I have studied alongside Daniel in the therapeutic sciences, though he specializes in off-grid permaculture. 
which inspires me. In his presentation, Facilitating Development of Life Purpose, he will cover various techniques that can be employed during sessions or recommended to clients for homework. Welcome, Daniel Mark Schwartz, one of the smartest people I know. As you said, I'm uh, Daniel Mark Schwartz, author of Offered Permaculture, and I am somebody that really loves to talk about what people do for a living, how um, we, you know, how we make a mark on the world, and when it comes to life coaching, I find that to be the single most important thing that you can do when you start with a client is to uh, excuse me, facilitate them developing a life purpose. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about here today. This is a, about a 30, 35 minute talk and I'm going to be going over why you would want to start with them, both in the sense where you know why it makes sense to start with this with your clients and to explain to them the theory. Then I'm going to have a big section on what makes a good life purpose because many people say they have a life purpose, they may even write it down. But when it comes to it, it's horrible for getting them where they want to go, right? It's not going to get them to the life purpose. It's not going to get them out of the situation they're in. Um, and so that's a big area that, that you have a room for growth with most clients. And then finally, I've got three methods of, uh, well, three example methods that you can work with with your clients. So step-by-step -step methods to get them and yourselves in preparation to your life purpose. Um, so first step, theory. Okay, before we get really into this though, I just want to tell everybody that I kind of consider this to be a back and forth. So if anybody wants to butt in with questions or information that I think may, may be relevant or, or whatever discussion, you know, feel free to just do that anytime. I like to have a, a conversation going. So, is it possible to improve people's well-being? It's a really widely debated thing among the you know the psycho, uh, psychology community. Um, and there is research both ways, but what this graph is here to show is by the probability weightings that the psychological process, so the way people are thinking, actually has an extremely profound impact on the actual well-being, both perceived and um, like perceived by themselves and objectively perceived by others. So the psychological processes are a key factor in what makes somebody successful. And that's why we need to focus on psychological processes. And one of the main parts of the psychological process which didn't fit into this is actually our perception of, of what events mean to us, right? There's no such thing as an objectively bad event. There's no such thing as an objectively good event. There's a famous story from the Tao where the farmer has his uh, son go into the forest and find a, a extra uh, horse that was just out there. And everyone says, oh, well, that's really great of you that you got this horse. And he says, maybe, maybe not. And then the son is breaking the horse and he breaks his leg. And then everyone says, oh, it's a great misfortune that your son broke his leg. And the farmer says, well, maybe, maybe not. And the story goes on and on, but eventually the son gets, gets skipped over for going to war because his leg is broken, but then you know, this and that happens. And so how we, we respond to situations is key to how successful we will be in life and our clients will be. Um, so this is a quote from one of the main researchers of, of this paper. While we can't change a person's family history or their life experiences, it is possible to help a person to change the way they think and to teach them positive coping strategies that can mitigate and reduce stress levels. So that's at the very least what we're doing with people, with our clients, is reducing their stress level by changing the way that they think and giving them positive coping strategies. So I'm going to be giving you a lot of different other resources as I go through here, and one that I really like is to start with why. And this is why I always start with life purpose. Um, and this book is great because the author goes through um, 10 or 15 extremely influential people who built their empire. Steve Jobs is probably the, the most, uh, the, the spotlight of the book, but Martin Luther King, the Wright brothers, right? And what do they do differently than everyone else who failed? The hundreds of other computer companies that didn't become multi-billionaires, the hundreds of the people that were funded by the government but weren't able to fly when the Wright brothers can do it in their garage, you know, without any exterior funding. They started with a reason why, a, a really compelling goal that got them there, then they move to the how, and then they move to what they're doing. So often people start with, well, I'm gonna do this, and then, well, how am I gonna do that? Well, I'm gonna do it this way, and then, well, why am I doing it? Right? They invert the whole pyramid, the whole bullseye. So if we start with the why, with the life purpose, then people are, have been, you know, historically, shown to be much more effective. I spelled, I spelled Martin, apparently. <laughs> So purpose is essential at every stage. And this is really essential when working with somebody else because without purpose, they're not gonna get up in the morning 
to do what they need to do. They're not going to take it seriously, right? There might be a, a burst of motivation to get them through the door, but unless we keep the eye on the goal, the chances of you having a successful outcome with a client is very, very low, right? I'm sure everyone's seen this in their own lives, right? Without a reason to put in the hard work that comes, but without a reason to stick with it, you're not going to stick with it. The other thing is there's a lot of doings out there, but not a lot of getting stuff done. And this is linked to a really famous Prater principle and sometimes called the 80-20. But the, that the most effective, like 80% of what actually makes us the money and gets us the, you know, what we're looking for and helps other people is really 20% of what we're doing, right? And, and even within that, there's an 80-20 in there. So there's a small fraction, just like there's a small fraction of people that make the majority of money in the country and everyone else makes the rest, there's a small fraction of what we're doing that makes us effective. And so by having a purpose, you can match up your daily activities and your client's daily activities with what is actually getting you in that direction. Because as, uh, well, as Alice in Wonderland said, if you're going nowhere, you're definitely going to get there. Right. So another quote, Arnold Schwarzenegger, I'm a big believer that if you have a very clear vision of where you want to go, then the rest of it is much easier. Right. This is a man who, he started working out under a soccer field in his hometown, and he would actually break in in the dead of winter and wrap towels around his hands so he could lift weights. You know, but he didn't see it as a sacrifice that he was in a, such a freezing cold room that he was worried that his hands were going to freeze to the weights he was using. He saw that as an opportunity to get ahead, right? And so he was actually really excited about it. He was looking forward to going to the gym those days, where most of us would be like, you know, that's almost torture. And that's, but and he was doing it because he had these posters up in his room of these bodybuilders that he met and that he saw in movies as a kid. He said, "I'm going to be one of them," and that's what got him to everything that he's done. You know, he's been an actor, he's been a politician, um, and it's always been clear goals. Every step along the way, people said, you can't do it, right? But he said, I'm gonna do it. And by having those pictures in his room, his vision ahead of him, he was willing to make this, take the steps that it made it work. Okay, so now here's the larger section, how to identify effective So, broad thing, find something that's worth living for. It has to be an emotionally compelling thing to the person. And it, it could seem really simple. You know, it, it could be, I'm, I just want to you know, make this little bit of my world a better place, or I just want 10 people to remember me, or something. But it has to be psychologically uh, motivating to people. Um, so we're going to get into this a bit, bit more in depth. So this is a huge area where people, uh, I think, fail. And is even though it doesn't have to be a big dream, most people that I've met and coached with don't really respond to small dreams. Right? People are really psychologically motivated Many people by big, out-of-this-world dreams. Like Steve Jobs, I want to change the world with computers. Or, you know, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, I want people to know me around the world for my physique and, uh, you know, to be that person on the, the posters that other little boys are looking up to. Right? Saying, you know, I just want to make it through this month, or I want to live in the normal house in the neighborhood, the slightly bigger house in the neighborhood. It might be a fine goal, but it's not, if it's not emotionally today, it's not going to get there. And for most people, that isn't. Um, so safe dreams do not motivate you, or most people. So if it's not motivating, you got to go big. So in this phase of the dream building, it's great to just let everything go wild, you know, let uh, abandon caution, and just throw out seeds and see where it comes up. You, you may never guess what your life uh, purpose is. And for many people who are coaching, they probably have never guessed what their real life purpose is. They may have things that they're th orbiting around that they think that's it. But it could be that that, you know, I've always wanted to be a dancer, but my parents poo-pooed it when I was six. And then that's been suppressed so deep that it could take many sessions to really get that out. So by narrowing in too much on their current career or what they've been doing in the past, you're likely to actually miss what the thing is that would really motivate them. And so a big tool for this is, is journaling. So uh, focus on what is important. Um, so a lot of times we get sidetracked with day-to-day -day stuff, with stuff that seems important, stuff that's other people's importance that they put on us. Um, and that is going to be a major roadblock in actually getting to the success for you and your client. Um, so one thing that people, and especially my line of work, that people have problems with is actually money. People are saying, well, I don't have the time, I don't have the money um, to get to where I'm going, to pay for what I want to do, to go to these classes. Uh, and that I find is huge mistake, there's almost always room to minimize what you're currently doing and make room for what you want to do, right? People spend 
hundreds or thousands of dollars a month on stuff that if they really took the time to analyze and budget, they would probably say, well, I don't need four hundred dollars a month on coffee, you know, I can spend home. Or, you know, I could even, one big thing is downsizing a little bit. Like if, if somebody's really in a tough spot, almost everyone's paying rent and utilities. And if it comes down to it, to really have a life goal that's worth, that's worth living for, then it, it might make sense to temporarily downsize that, maybe, you know, sell the car, get a little cheaper running car, and put yourself in a place where you can actually day-to-day -day take action, because taking action is where people are gonna get results. There's so much talk out there and people that, that sounds like a great idea, I'd love to do that. Get people to take action through these life goals and through very concrete steps, and by putting them in a financial, psychological place where they can actually do it, then, you know, they're just gonna float away and keep doing what they're doing, just like most of us do, unfortunately. So in line with this, people a lot of times when they're talking about life goals are worried about their status in society and they're worried about the money. And that's a big roadblock because you never know what's going to make you successful. Just like you know, your friend, a lot of parents would say, well, don't, you know, don't waste time with instruments or music. You're not going to make money on that. Go be a Wall Street banker or something. Right? But when you are really passionate about something, that's when money comes to you because money comes from when you give value to other people. And so whatever you have of value is what you need to be giving to people and figuring out how to make it a monetary thing, how to make it pay for the bills, all right? So don't, it's a huge trap everyone gets into to say, well, this is a higher paying career, that's what I should do, all right? And people have internalized this, so you may not recommend, uh, recommend it to people, they might not even think that they're following that path, but it gets internalized so much for children that we're likely, you're likely to encounter it with clients that you work with. All right, so the next thing is focus on goals on life purpose where you can constantly improve in that field. Yeah, okay, so that was in the, so constantly improving. Now, next big topic is giving something away. So life purpose where you're actually motivated to help other people for the purpose of helping other people is not only a good thing to do, it actually is much more effective, right? There's a, a study that shows that people are more likely to give their dogs their, med the, their medication on time than to themselves because people intrinsically care more about the people around them than they do about themselves. And that's a good thing and a bad thing. You know, people are there to sacrifice and they're, they're willing to um, put themselves second to other people. But um, it's bad when we're trying to put ourselves and our clients ahead because they may not be doing what it takes to, to make themselves what they can be. And while it's unfortunate because that makes, you know, it leaves somebody at 40% or 20% of their maximum capabilities, so they're not really putting themselves in a place where they can help other people the maximum. Um, it's difficult to get that point across, like it doesn't emotionally resonate, which is why the life purpose needs to actually have a component of helping other people in it. That way, you know, I may not get up this morning for myself to be successful, but I may get up because I have a chance to help out somebody else today. Um, so compassion, and I just mentioned the, the, the dog thing, but um, fighting for other people is actually our biggest strength. Uh, there's another statistic that comes up where the people who won uh, the Victoria's Cross, which is basically the, the Medal of Honor for um, English people, or British people, the British Empire, almost all of them were older siblings, uh, families where the parents were either were not there or were somehow incapacitated, right? So the people who were able to make these heroic gestures, put themselves before other people, uh, were doing it because they had a really strong instinct to treat other people around them like younger siblings that they were protecting. So that's a really powerful mindset to get into, right? We're not other people's parents, we're not there to tell them what to do because we're smarter, but we are, maybe we know something a little more than them and we're their old, older siblings and they're, we're there to help. And that will get you through, you know, these, it's gotten these people through amazing things and it will get you through amazing things as well. Um, so focus hugely on what your special talents and interests are. Um, and this may take some development again, but everybody has a little bit of something different than everyone else. They have key parts of themselves that are potentially dormant and need development, but by focusing on that, you're very likely to find something, uh, a life purpose that your clients are actually gonna be successful with, right? There's always stuff that people just love doing that's naturally fun to them that isn't fun to everybody else. Um, you know, I'm a science and math guy and most people, uh, that I used to tutor and a lot of people hate it, <laughs> right? But I was good at that, so I, you know, I focused on that and that was great. And there's other things that I dislike, you know? I, you could take me to a paint store and I'd be dead, I'd be bored in 15 minutes because I don't, I don't care about that stuff. But there's people I go with who are just so engrossed by all the different colors and the, a little bit of this and a little bit of that and those mix and it's, it's out there for everyone to find for themselves. 
So last night, or in this vein as well, uh, find things that you're proud of to show other people or that your clients are proud of to show other people. Um, it's hugely important that the, our clients define their own metric of success, right? Which is, if I you know, look back on today or this month or this year, was what I did, you know, not everything worked out the way I thought it would, but was that overall successful? Or on what scale from one to 10, how successful was that? And what can I do to get it more successful? Right, if we're not reviewing what we've done, if we're not improving ourselves, as I mentioned in the previous slide, you're really not going to get anywhere, right? Because you, if you're just randomly trying things without having a direction to it, um, you're going to be unsuccessful. It, you're just, you know, it's like, am I going to win the lottery versus am I going to build a business? You know, you may make, you may not fit, uh, succeed on every step of building a business, but as long as you succeed enough times, you're eventually going to get there, as long as you're with it long enough. Um, so, in order to do that though, we can't operate on what society tells us is a success. We have to operate on what we tell ourselves is a success, on our metric of success of what we did today, being towards our goal or against our goal. So, making a world a better place, like, the life goal, by the end of it, we should, it should leave everyone with a legacy that they feel like, this is what I've contributed to society and the world around me. Um, and then the third major area is reconnecting with nature. So I'm an opted permaculturist, of course, so that's a big thing to me. But with everybody, the research has shown that even just the color green makes people more relaxed. But there's so many aspects of being in nature um, that make people feel less stress, it's like not, just, you know, not just mentally, but chemically in the body. Uh, it gets us to a much stronger place. And so by having nature as part of you know, somehow mixing the life purpose, great way to get people that first jump and going uh, in the right direction. So spending out times outdoors, why do we need to do this? I mentioned it makes us calmer. Um, people are way, have a uh, larger ability to reflect on their past actions when they're in nature. So this could be a tool for us as life coaches to somehow do an activity that gets us more nature, whether it's in a room with a beautiful view or whether it is actually outdoors if, when the weather permits. Um, but that could be a super powerful tool for us. You know, there's so many of us that are cave dwellers that live in these walls that are, you know, maybe we have windows, but that's not necessarily being entirely outside. And the other thing is that we are being const constantly bombarded by electromagnetic radiation. And, you know, we don't 100% know what all that does to us, but we do know things like Wi-Fi from your computers um, makes people have a hard time sleeping. Or, and it also makes REM sleep not as available, right? That's some of the little research that's been done. They've shown that there's significant effect on men's testosterone levels and um, <coughs> sperm count by just having a cell phone in your pocket for a couple hours. And this has been tested all over the world. So, you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's probably millions of ways that this is affecting us that we just haven't had the time or inclination to research. So getting a little time away from that, you know, even if it's not your own phone, there's stuff everywhere. And then there's the power lines. So getting a little bit into nature can just give you that time to, to, to relax in your body, that time to recover. Um, uh, another little quote, the universe and the light of the stars come through me. So this is just to touch base on, there is a spiritual aspect to everybody. What the, really? <laughs> 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 well, it's uh, pressing and I, it's just such a powerful quote, as if you probably agree, because the spiritual aspect of everyone's life is there. And, um, you know, we're not, many of us are not part of religion anymore, or, you know, we're changing religions, or that aspect of social society is, is minimized, good and for the bad, because People need a spiritual connection. And so if that isn't in your client's life somehow, um, it, it makes sense to try to, to steer them in a direction where they can feel that, whether it's you know just looking at the stars at night or whether it's a more organized type of religious experience. And now this one, I think people forget a lot about is developing actual real skills that do things with your hands. Right? I mean, I'm a computer person. I do most of my work on the computer, but it's just so, um, rewarding to actually be able to do something. And like it or not, people around you are actually going to take you more seriously if you have something visible that you can do that's a skill. Whether it's playing an instrument, building, you know, woodworking, writing nicely, um, uh, you know, pottery, almost anything. But developing new skills actually makes you feel better about yourself because you're getting positive feedback from people around you. Um, so I would encourage everybody to to themselves and their clients, as you're doing now, constantly go to courses, read books, improve your value to society. Um, 
because you know psychologically we actually communicate how we feel about ourselves to other people and they communicate it back right so our posture the way that our face moves you know, it's all subconscious psychologically broadcasting what we think our worth in society is to other people and then people subconsciously are responding to that and it's broadcasting you back to you so little things that you can do to make somebody's self-worth increase you, you know a pottery class is a huge step in the right direction because it magnifies people are going to give you a little more self-worth back because you feel like you have worth then you're going to feel a little more worth there and if you can spiral that up that's how we're going to get people out of depression and out of these difficult situations I've, this is the start of the three methods and so these are things i think that are going to be really valuable for you to use for yourself or on your clients so in your handouts i have a printout with all of the methods on it um, and i also have a link on the in the handout in your book to uh, my website where you can download this in PDF form, which means you can copy paste it and put it in your own documents or expand upon it. Um, I didn't have room to have a full write-in section because I just wanted to get it on one sheet to make it a little more convenient. So you can split that up and have either sections for your clients to write below or just hand it to them and uh, write it yourself. But So I'm gonna go through where I got these. Um, these are all come with references as well uh, so that you can build up your credentials and your uh, list of, of you know, your bibliography with your clients. And it's basically my idea with this is that's kind of a smorgasbord. So you might pick a little bit out of one method, or you might say, okay, method two works better for this person um, because this is that client's interest versus method one and so on and so forth. So uh, I'm gonna start by going through the different methods step by step. So method one, this is what I call the Pavlina method uh, by life coach, blogger, Steve Pavlina. Um, so this is from his website, and this is the quickest um, and probably most directly effective one. Now, it, it takes a bit of commitment on the, the part of the person doing it to get there, um, but I think it's a great way to start if you have somebody that's really committed to the process, and, and, and that's the key. The key with this thing is you're gonna be doing this process for as long as it takes, and have setting an intention before you go in that I'm not getting up until I've found my life purpose, will make it happen, right? That's the difference between it being successful and not being successful. Because if you go into the mindset, well, I'm gonna try this for 30 minutes, it doesn't work, I'm just gonna leave. You're gonna sit there for 30 minutes, it's not gonna work, and then you're gonna leave. Right? So, because this is all about pulling out stuff from your subconscious and from your deeper psychology. So, method, open up a writing, way of writing. Uh, word processor, sheet of paper, whatever they're comfortable with. Right on the top, what is my true life purpose? Just write whatever pops in your head as an answer. It doesn't have to be a sentence, it doesn't have to be anything, it could be a paragraph, whatever they feel like writing, just the first thing that comes up, write it down, right? Then do that again and again and again. Keep writing the stuff that comes to your head as answers. As quickly as you can, try not to filter it. There's gonna be a little filtering there, but just put it directly on the paper, and you know you've gotten there when it makes you cry, right? Or you at least get that emotion welling up. Like it's amazingly effective, this method is, and it can be quite short. Um, but if it takes three hours, if it takes four hours, like be, be prepared to, <laughs> your subconscious is almost like an unruly child, and he's gotta sit there with, with loving presence and wait until it, it's done throwing a tantrum. And so it, it, take, it might take as long as it takes, but as long as you are willing, and your client is willing to put in that, that commitment up front and to have that discipline, then it's an absolutely amazing method. Okay, so this me method is probably the exact opposite. This is more the intellectual, like let's build it up um, type of method. So this may be a good way to, to, to lead in with clients that are not necessarily as super on board with method one um, or you know, that type of working. So this comes from a book called Work Energy, which actually came out about a month ago. Um, and it's, it's more on the, like, the productivity, business management type side. And it, it's an amazing book, I recommend it. Um, there's a link on the, the sheet as well, but it, it's a, the goal of it is to help people get from where they're not as productive as they wanna be in the business, in the workplace, and in life to figuring out what it is about them that can make them super productive. Uh, so this is just one small segment from that book, but um, it's, so it's a question and answer, series of question and answers. So the first one is, when you come up with something to play with your kids, what do you do? So this may need to be adjusted if the person is single, um, but you know, with your family, with people that they like, with their pets, whatever it is, uh, this is a really good way. Oops, I went. Anyway, so this is a good way to to look into what when people what people do when they don't feel like they're being judged or we're watching them gives you a big insight to what uh, would actually make them tick. Right. So this can be adjusted anyway, like that. 
you know, what vacations do you want to go on? What do you dream of your kids becoming, even if you don't have kids yet? What would you be really happy if your kids became? Because that is more about what you want to become rather than what your kids should be, right? In many cases. Um, so you all that. Uh, what unique life experiences have you had that forced you to learn certain traits? So this is looking into your history. Um, whatever situations are you really pr proud about? What situation made you sad in the past? Um, you know, how is, do you having siblings, has that affected you? Um, and then question three, who is someone who you loved and whose personality other people has found off -putting? So This is really cool because it has that uh, contrarian element to it. Uh, somebody that you loved, but other people wouldn't necessarily. So it, it puts a lot of uh, a spotlight on what the differences between you and what you perceive other people's perceptions to be. So it's not even really about what other people are, are you know, would perceive it to be. It's what the client thinks other people would perceive about it. Um, and this gets in the whole psychological projection aspect, which I'm, you probably are all familiar with. Uh, basically, you know, we see in other people what we see, in, what we feel about ourselves, but we're not ready to admit. So that was question three. Uh, four, what would a perfect work day look like in your current job? So now this is getting more towards the, the basic aspect, but so much of what we feel about ourselves comes from our profession. So g getting people's profession into it is an is a important thing to do, right? You can look at that historically, how many people's names are based off what their great, great, great grandparents did, right? Like my last name is Schwartz Black, has to do with blacksmithing. There's a ton of that out there. And in older societies, people weren't even necessarily given a last name. They were just called by what their role in the village was. So people need to, uh, their life purpose needs to incorporate a bit of um, what their role in society is. And that's what we're talking about, giving back, but, and the, your perception to other people. So linking into your, their profession is, is key to that. Um, five, what do you intentionally do to impress other people? That's a great question. You know, if, that, that lies, uh, lights up so much about the inner personality. So uh, just putting that out there is going to probably leave you to interesting life coaching uh, points in that in the session. Six, what character trait are you proud of in yourself? So focus on not only what you want to change, but what the client is already good at and is already interested, um, well, is already proud of in their capabilities, because that's a great launching point to spread that out to the rest of the life. Um, Seven, when you're growing up, what well, was something hard to do, but which you enjoyed working on? So harking back to the everyone has their own special, you know, things that they like to do, their own, like, God-given, if you will, uh, traits. Uh, ferreting those out is super powerful to get people motivated, interested, and going. Um, so then, and there's a twist at the end, after you've done that to yourself or to the, your client, have them get somebody significant to them, a spouse, a friend, somebody that they really trust to answer those same questions about the person, right? So um, ask them, well, you know, what if Tim is your client, then you ask Tim's friend, what does Tim do with his kids? What is, you know, what is Tim's uh, character traits that you think he's proud of type of, so, and that is a really interesting way to, sh to shine a mirror on what other people actually think about the client because usually when people are in, in need of, um, improvement and are seeking out help, it's because they have some kind of disconnect with the people around them. And so that can also not only give you fodder to work with because you're seeing them through the, the eyes of somebody that knows them well, but also it, it can reflect back to your client, um, can be used to show them actually what people do think about them and maybe get them a little more aligned with the, the reality of the situation. Okay, and then method three is the psychosynthesis method. Real quick, psychosynthesis, uh, excuse me, psychosynthesis is an older from the 1965-ish um, psychological method. Um, and it, it kind of, it gets, it comes in and out of fashion, but it's something that I've always really enjoyed. So there's a nice older book can get used about it that has the condensed writing called psychosynthesis. Um, and uh, so this is borrowed, not directly from, from them, but based on their, their conception of how human psychology works. And the reason why I really like their method is because it's not just about um, helping people have you know, a condition. It's their main focus is actually getting people from, let's say, average to exceptional. So they're the other half of that, that uh, the, the puzzle, not just getting people from dysfunctional to functional, but functional to super functional. And so they're, unfortunately, I don't have the graphic, but um, I, their conception of the human psychology is that there's three levels of unconsciousness. So we have the consciousness in the center, and then around us we have a lower, a middle, and a higher subconsciousness. And all of these are essentially like completely different people in a way that are all part of us, and they have different wants, and they have different ways of perceiving the world. And so the psychosynthesis member 
uh, method is we're going to take a paper and divide it into three sections for the three levels of subconscious and then let your client free associate um, with the intention of finding the best imaginable outcomes on each level. So this is basically setting goal setting or purpose setting through free association but from the aspect of my lowest level, my middle level, and my highest level. So you'll have to go to the book if you want a more fuller uh, uh, or maybe take one of our you know, longer courses, which I would get into a lot more. But in the short, the lower is kind of our base psychological needs, you know, like enjoyment, food, you know, sex, that type of stuff. Um, in the middle is more of our intellectual understanding. So kind of like what most people would call ego, um, more directly, so like direct shows of value from people around us, um, uh, power, that that kind of stuff. So it's not necessarily it's it takes a little explanation because it's not necessarily a negative thing, right? We and most of a, a lot of psychological literature or New Agey type literature, that stuff is is seen as the enemy and it's the shadow side. And we're trying to get rid of it. Um, now that may or may not be possible, but. For most of us, there's part of it there, and so the, a successful life goal is actually going to have to incorporate that side in it, right? So we we like to plan ourselves as being the martyr, uh, but if we're but those kind of goals fail, so we need to incorporate our you know our little child into that as well. Yes. Psychosynthesis, uh, collection of writings. I have the link um, on the paper actually, so you can just go to Amazon and see it from there. But and then so the top level is the actual, like what we, most people think about themselves, like the, the saint aspect of it, you know, the giving part of you, um, and th that doesn't need too much explanation because that's what a lot of people plan for anyway. And then finally, go through all three segments after you've written, you know, filled up the page with all of your free association of things that you would like as a life goal, and then see if you can find a vein that runs all, all through it, something that is, you know, like a pillar where this is part of it, and this is part of it, and this is part of it, and the whole goal extends through all three levels. Life coach and research scientist in alternative treatment modalities and therapies, Juanita Holiday invites you to join her in this edition of In the Lab with Juanita, where she shares about her experience in practicing as a life coach and her three circles of influence. Here's Juanita Holiday in the lab with Juanita. If you're like me and you come from a background that made you feel like you could never get ahead, then one day you've experienced a huge life change. Maybe you discovered that things are not as you've been told they were, and maybe you could change your life. Maybe you're just tired of living the same dull life every day, day in and day out, and you think that there must be more to this life or maybe you're waking up to see that things are not exactly like everyone you trusted told you they were and you're starting to get the idea that you can change the way you look at things and you can do things that can change your life and if you can do that you could even change the world my name is Juanita Holiday, and today I am a life coach and I work in a research lab and it wasn't that long ago that it was me wondering if anything good could happen in my life. And if that is you, you're not alone. And there's a good chance that if you start on this journey of making a new life for you, experimenting, growing, and changing for no one else but you, there's a good chance that you may have a powerful and rich future helping others like us to do the same thing as a life coach. And I have fun doing it. It's not a mistake that you are here with me right now. That shows that we have some things in common. No one is going to tell us what to do. We are going to explore and make our own decisions about how we feel, what we think, and who we are, and we're going to defend the rights of others to think for themselves and to help them carve out their own paths to whatever they want. I know if you've only been doing this work on yourself, it can sound a little overwhelming, 
but I know there is no better sense of feeling good about what you are doing to help others as to be with someone when they see something differently meet a goal that they have always wanted to do or to totally turn into a new more powerful person for the very first time that makes this work all worth it when I started working with a client who is a little frustrated at where they are in their life by helping them get an idea about all three circles of influence this is a great experience that you can use as a life coach and you can play along with me as I show you how it goes you draw three circles three of them control influence and no go the idea is that there are many aspects of your life some things you have control over they go in the control circle then there are things that you might not have control over but you could offer input do or say something that might make whatever it is go one way or the other you have some influence over those things so they go in the influence circle then there are things that you have no control of and no influence with so those things go on the no-go circle your life is made of all three circles I always get my clients started with writing something in each circle like in the first circle if you think about it what is a something that you have control over some starters might be you have control over what you think or you have control over how you may behave many of us have learned that one the hard way there are the things that you can offer some influence which can have an effect on someone or something like you can offer support to someone who is feeling down do people come to you for advice can you share an experience where you were not in a good situation but you made it to the other side you could never have control over the way someone thinks or feels but you could influence what they think what they feel by giving them something to think about this is influence the third circle is the no-go circle and you put all the things that you have no control over so it goes in the no-go circle when you have finished writing the things you have control over the things that you can influence and the things that are a no-go you want to understand how to focus your energy your life force you want to give as much attention and energy in the things that you can control the most and then what energy is left over focus on the things that you can influence as for the no-goes you already know there's nothing you can do about those things so don't waste your time don't waste your energy on those things so if you're thinking about living a life of being a life coach then that's my advice for you by managing your own energy by focusing on those things that can have control over and support the people and the things where you can be influential and those things that you can't do anything about just don't go there and by all means have fun find more ways to have fun and live a happier life with more power in your life start living it better for yourself and for a better world to find out how to be a life coach you can contact St. Paul's Free University or you can contact me my name is Juanita Holiday, and you can find out more about me at JuanitaHoliday.com thank you and have a great day Longtime life coach to children, adults, and families, Wendy Lynn Johnson deeply connects with her clients and her therapeutic science tool belt is filled with a variety of healing modalities. In Wendy's Law of Attraction and Life Coaching presentation, she will introduce you to the Law of Attraction and how it can help you to be supremely successful as a coach. Join Wendy in diving into a few simple processes you can use to help your clients shift using the law of attraction put yourself and your clients into the driver's seat of life my life coach Wendy Lynn Johnson welcome this morning everyone my name is Wendy Johnson I got to figure this out there we go and 
kid expert, so we'll start with that. I did childcare for 22 years out of my home in um, Olympia area. Um, and I moved from that into life coaching. And I am a certified law of attraction life coach. Um, I do hypnotherapy, I'm a Reiki master, and I love to try on new modalities. I love to learn new things. And I'm open to learning new things with all of you. But today we're here and in your packet you have a handout that's stippled together. LOA Life Coach. LOA is a Law of Attraction. And so we're going to just kind of go through this and it's kind of a fill in the blank thing because by now we're the third talk in and we're getting kind of tired of just sitting here and listening. Even though it's all really great information, um, it gives you something more to do and help bit of help on focusing. Law of Attraction. What is the Law of Attraction? Or also, like I said, it's referred to as LOA. So according to Wikipedia, it is a belief that positive or negative thoughts brings positive or negative experiences. So in our first blank, the word will be experiences into a person's life. The belief is based on people and their thoughts. They are made from pure energy. And that a process of like energy attracting like energy exists through which a person can improve their health, wealth, and personal relationships. I was behind. <laughs> So the law of attraction manifests through the power of creation. Everywhere and in many ways, even the law of gravity is part of the law of attraction. This law attracts thoughts, ideas, people, situations, and circumstances. When Thinking of questions about how the law of attraction works, people commonly assume that they can make it work at specific times or do something to bring it into their lives. What you need to understand is that the law of attraction is constantly working. It is influencing everything you do and experience throughout every day. It makes more sense to think about the how you can harness the power of the law of attraction, directing the associated energy in ways that allow you to get what you want. And according to Esther and Jerry Hicks book, Ask and It Is Given, have any of you heard of that book? Have you read it? It's a great book, by the way. It has a lot of great tools in it to use in your coaching. Um, and we're going to talk about one today. I, it's in your packet. It's called the wheel process. Um, <clears throat> the law of attraction says that which is like unto itself is drawn. And so you might see the powerful law of attraction as a sort of a universal manager that sees to it that all thoughts that match one another line up. You understand it's fundamental when you turn on your radio and you deliberately tune your receiver to match a signal from a broadcasting tower. You do not expect to hear music that is being broadcast on the radio frequency 101 FM to be received on your tuner that is tuned to 95.1 FM you understand that radio frequencies must match, and the law of attraction agrees with that. That's kind of a scientific side of it. So as your client's experiences cause them to launch vibrational rockets of desire, you must then help them find ways to hold themselves consistently in vibrational harmony with those desires in order to receive their manifestations. 
as I just talked about, we're going to um, look at one of Abraham's processes, and it's called the focus wheel. We're going to, um, but first thing we will do is we're going to talk about when to use this exercise or process. When you realize that yours or your client's current vibrational point is point of attraction is not where you want it to be. So if you're trying to move some feelings and emotions. When you're aware that you are feeling negative emotions about something that is important and you want to find a way of feeling positive emotions instead. When something has happened that is not your liking and you want to think about it while it is on your mind and change your point of attraction so that it does not happen again. So when you are reaching for a feeling of a relief, so if you're looking for some relief with something, this is a great process to use. The focus wheel exercise will be the most beneficial to you when your emotional scent point is raging somewhere between an eight, which is boredom, and 17, which is anger. So in your handouts, I've also given you what's called an emotional guidance scale. This can help you and your clients determine your set point, as well as the progress you make when you are working to change your vibration. I find it really helpful to check in at the very beginning of every session that I do. And then I check in again at the end of the session with my clients or when I'm doing work with myself. And I ask them where they think they are on a scale of one to 10. For an, and I also ask them at the same time for an emotion that accompanies that number because not everybody's heard of the emotional guidance scale. So what they say to you, they might tell you, oh, I'm a one today, I'm so happy. And you're like, wait a minute. So then that gives you the opportunity to dive into what, where they feel they are. Um, or if you have an emotional scale, guidance scale handy, and you're one-on-one -on -one, face to face, you can hand them the scale and say, hey, where do you think you are on this today? You know, talk to me about it. Tell me where you think you are. So, that helps me to determine where their actual set point is. Then at the end of our session, I revisit it, and the idea is to move down the scale. Any movement is improvement. It is just a way to track to know where your client is. No movement is okay. Sometimes we have to walk away for the movement to happen. Yeah. Another amazing source I use is the essence of the Abraham material, which is the basis of working with the law of attraction. Um, and then I have a reference in here for you. The basis of your life is freedom. The purpose of your life is joy. Second, you are a creator. You create with your every thought. Anything that you can imagine is yours to be to do or have. As you are choosing your thoughts, your emotions are guiding you. The universe adores you, for it knows your broadest intentions. Actions to be taken and possessions to be exchanged are byproducts of your focus on joy. It is not necessary for even one other person to understand the laws of the universe or the processes that we are offering in order for you to have a wonderful, happy, and productive life experience. For you are the attractor of your experience, just you. And as we go through life experiences, we often adopt beliefs that hold us at a vibrational pattern that do not allow us to receive what we truly desire. The point that, oh, but it really is true. Remember, what we think about comes about. So the only way this could be true is someone was giving attention to it in some way. Just because someone else has created their truth does not mean that it has any relationship to you or what you create. In your attempt to keep track of the events in your timeline, you often, without even knowing you are doing it, hold yourself in vibrational patterns. That makes it assured that you will confirm the truth with your own life experience. 
This is not because it is an undeniable truth. It is because in the attention given to it, you have achieved vibrational harmony with it. With that being said, the law of action brings matching experiences. Some of our guided thought patterns are extremely beneficial to us. Others, however, not so much. They can actually do more damage, keeping us on that hamster wheel going round and round in the same old negative pattern. This focus wheel is a great tool to be used, assisting in changing those vibrational patterns on those subjects that are not benefiting you. You can literally practice your thoughts into a better feeling place. Therefore, into a better point of attraction. So, the next one is how often? The recommendation is to spend about 15 to 20 minutes with this process. Anytime you feel strong negative emotions, about something that has happened, or any time you wish to improve your feelings, any time you become keenly aware of something that you do not want. So you all have a focus wheel in your packet. I'll have, encourage you all to pull that out and kind of take a look at it. So as we go through the next couple um, paragraphs, I'm gonna kind of just guide you how I would a client so you know how it's done but when we actually go through and practice this we're gonna use a specific topic and we're gonna use the topic of taxes but I'll get to that in a few minutes because we all have that in our life right and we all have an emotion about it uh, okay so first thing I do is I would have you close your eyes for a moment and turn your attention to whatever you're feeling negative emotions about Okay, so this is what you would do with your client. You would have them go inward and find what it is that they're feeling negative emotions about and identify exactly what it is that you don't want. So you wanna identify what you do not want. Now, I want you to say to yourself, well, I certainly know what I don't want. So what is it that I really do want? It is important to try and identify what you do not want as well as what you do want in terms of how you want to feel about it because that'll help you figure out how you want to feel about it. For example, I feel fat. I want to feel <coughs> slender. I feel unloved. I want to feel loved. I feel deceived. I want to feel honored. I feel powerless. I want to feel power. I feel sick. I want to feel well. I want to feel healthy. So we are going to write statements around the outside edge of the large circle inside the pie shapes. They look like this. These statements need to match what it is that you do want. When you find a statement that is a close enough match, you will know it and you will feel it. So you're, you're going to know it and you're going to feel it. You, Especially if you're empathic, you get those feelings going, you know. Otherwise, it will feel off and not like a vibrational match. And that's what we call going off in the bushes. You know, kind of like if we're talking about taxes, um, would we want to put on there, hey, I love taxes. I love paying the government. Does that feel really good? Probably not. That's going to throw us off in the bushes, right? The focus wheel process is a very effective because the statements you are writing are those that you have deliberately chosen. So they're a conscious choice. They are statements that you already believe that match your desire. So when you hold a thought for as little as 17 seconds, another thought like it will join it. As those thoughts come together, there is a combustion that occurs that makes your thoughts even more powerful. When we make a general statement, we are more likely to be pure in our thoughts than when we make a specific statement. So the power of the focus wheel is that you are making general statements that you already believe. And as you hold each one of them for 17 seconds, 
it gives you the opportunity to offer a pure vibration that is more and more specific to the desires that you have. So as I said before, we're gonna do this as an example, and the subject is going to be our taxes. So in the little center circle, mine looks like this, it's all written all over, right in this little center circle, we're gonna write our taxes, or my taxes, or something about taxes, because this is something we need to complete, right? We all do. And then I have a list here of different statements. So I'm gonna read them, and as I read them, maybe you all can comment whether you think we're off in the bushes, or maybe that would go in one of our little circles, pie circles, okay? So if we can make sure we understand how this works as an emotion, the one like I used earlier, I'm enjoying doing my taxes. How does that one fit? Does that fit? Do we, do we enjoy doing our taxes? <laughs> you might. <laughs> but the reality of this is, I don't enjoy doing any kind of book work, so this is not gonna be fun for me. But for somebody that really enjoys doing book work and things like that, they might get some joy out of this. So this is gonna be a different answer for each one of us. This is why we need to go within to get our answers. So the next one, I just think it is a wonderful thing that the government takes my money and squanders it. <laughs> so we wanna put that in the circle or think that's off in the bushes? Yeah, I think it's up. I like to be on top of my life. That one feels good. I like to be on top of my life. And if that means I have to get my taxes done, hmm, I might be able to do that. So I think I would put that in my, one of my little pies. It feels good to meet my commitments. I like it when I do things in a timely fashion. I love the feeling of being organized. I love the feeling of order and organization in my life. I imagine that there are a whole lot of people who have felt like I am feeling, who now have this thing handled. For some people, that is gonna be off in the bushes because it's kind of a comparative thing. But for some other people, it might bring them some comfort. Hey, if they did it, I can do it too. So while the IRS system is not perfect, it is a mechanism through which our government runs. Hmm. There again, some of us may like that one, some of us might be thrown off in the bushes. Every year, I am getting better at this. I am managing things more comfortably. I'll find ways to make it more comfortable. My taxes are a good incentive to help me sort of get organized and figure things out. Okay, so you may have them all filled in, you may not, but at this point, we are gonna move forward to the shift. We've not solved anything yet. Nothing has really changed. You still have your taxes to do. <laughs> However, the thing you most need to understand is that you're in a different place right now than you were before. We did that little exercise. <coughs> Clarity will come to you and your clients more easily than before this process. Memories will also come more easily than before. Remember, we're to hold each one of those thoughts for 17 seconds. You may suddenly remember where you put something. Those scattered pieces of paper. Oh, where you might have hid a handful of receipts that you need to enter. Um, things like that. All the pieces of information that you have scattered here and there are coming together in your mind, in your subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind will begin to feed you in a consistent way, in a way that did not happen before. You took those few minutes to align your energies with your desires. By applying this simple yet powerful focus wheel process to a variety of subjects as they come up in your life as well as your clients, you can effectively improve your point of attraction regarding everything that is important to you or your clients. You must get excited about your own vibration. 
to be proud of the vibration you are radiating. And remember, others only have access to the vibration that you are offering them. Even if the manifestation hasn't caught up with you, you are offering a powerful, a wonderful example. What could be better for your clients than having a coach who can offer an example of a positive attitude? under the same circumstance. Life coach, hypnotherapist, retired Oregon State mental health counselor, and founder of the Luna Institute of Curanderos, Rosa M. Luna has a few words to share with you about her life coaching experience and some practical tips for you as you get ready to go forth and exercise your prowess as a personal life coach. Life coach, Rosa M. Luna. Hello, my name is Rosa M. Luna with St. Paul's Free University. And I'm here to talk to you about becoming a personal life coach. Some of us have been working with people and doing this work without a degree or a certificate. Does this matter? Yes, let me explain in what way does this help. It could help you in making more money. Do you enjoy helping people, assisting them in discovering their talents and assisting them with their self-esteem and self-worth? And if you're a good listener, then this type of work is for you. Are you good at keeping secrets? Do you hear people say when you talk to them, I feel comfortable talking to you about this. I have never been able to tell anyone this before. You're a very good listener. Sometimes just in a conversation when meeting someone like at the bus station, waiting in line, or really anywhere, people just start talking to you. Also, when people say, thank you for helping me, does it feel good to help someone in need for some help? If this is you, then this course is for you. You have a talent. How would you help someone today during this time of the COVID-19 virus? People are cut off of other people right now. How would you lift someone's spirits up at this time? Maybe by offering your services as a life coach online. Have a cup of coffee with them online. Talk about happier times or just about something you both have in common. Some people just need to vent. Talk about what that person plans to do after all this is over and restrictions are lifted. Oh my God, we're all going to do everything we can. Have them explain their plans, especially detail per detail. It'll make them feel better. Or you can get together on a video like Skype, Zoom, or other means of face-to-face -face apps, which is like you can watch a funny movie or a comedy using these really cool new tech stuff. Have them make a snack or have them pop popcorn. Doesn't that already sound fun? People already need some of kind of a break. My daughter and I did this just the other day. Made us feel like we were together. She lives in Utah and we're missing each other big time. And she was feeling down. And so we got on Netflix and we enjoyed a good chick flick movie. And we talked through the movie, which we do this anyway when we go to the theater, only not as loud. So it was so nice. It was very nice. We didn't feel like we were so far away from each other. So in my over 23 years of working with people who suffer from depression or mental illness, I have found that I may have experiences that I can use as a life coach. And you too may have picked up some skills during your own life experience in life. So let's talk a little bit about that, about life coaching. You already find yourself here, so you may be interested. So this means you are a caring and an empathetic person. A number one quality of this work of, as a life coach. As a life coach, you're helping your client who is paying you to reach their goals and help them see how to reach them. This requires someone who enjoys assisting others. And as hard as it might be, and it could get that way sometimes, it will take patience, courage to tell them the truth about themselves, and love in your heart for your client. 
a caring kind of love for your human fellow man or woman. Start with a deep, in-depth interview. You know that there's no judging, to let the client know that there's no judging. This will make them feel more comfortable in opening up to you. And everything they tell you is confidential. Very important. This way they can keep opening up to you and feel comfortable doing that. And so you can also ask questions. What would you like help with? Do you have any goals or an idea of what part of your life you want help with? Ask other questions I could help you to know them too and this will help your client also to understand if she really wants to follow through, if they really think they need a life coach. One of the other things I'd like to do is keep files on people or portfolios. This will help you make decisions that could help your clients later, keeping records of dates that you met, dates that that person missed, appointments with you, keeping other important documents like the resume or recommendation letters. I used to use these to go over them with the client and assist this person with their self-esteem, self-worth. Reminding them to, about their accomplishments is very, very important because it helps their self-esteem. It could also help your client make decisions on your part or their part in keeping their facts straight. Also, that helped me with my clients with setting up a good calendar for scheduling appointments and set it up to help both of us. This will require more work and some clients will require more work too or less work. You can also assist them in over the phone or on Skype, Skype or Zoom or other cool camera equipment that has been very successful in this way of communication, especially with the COVID virus right now. This will turn out to be a very essential tool at this time due to the restrictions that they have been placed on us right now. Working face-to-face -face helps the life coach to see body mannerisms appear more accurate. You get a sense of the client's energy, especially if you know how to translate the energies in a person. Like when you walk into a room and you feel someone has had an argument and you wouldn't really know there, but you know. A lot of us are very sensi sensitive in that way, right? As life coaches, we are not supposed to give advice. We are not to use words like, you should have done this, you should have done that. It's a, really, it's about helping others to explore their choices and that person's figuring out what is best for them. We may know the answer, but that person needs to figure it out for themselves. This holds a greater impact in figuring out and finding solutions for themselves. They're really working at changing their behavior because that behavior has not been serving them, has it? Another thing, no need to shake their fingers at, at them. We already get that from other well-meaning friends, parents, and significant others who even though they do that because they care for you or want the best for you, but what worked for them just might not work for you. We're talking about the clients right now. We have to find our own niche. Mention this to your client. It will help their own self-esteem. Another subject that will help your client to progress is homework. Homework? Yuck! Not all clients like doing homework. That's why they're paying you. Actually, you are like a teacher or a guide to them. Remind them that that is why you are there to help them to be successful. Some of us need to be pushed. I was, and yes, I did not like it. I felt like they were wasting their time and mine too. As a life coach, you will have good days and bad days, but in this way, you will both discover whether you are a good fit for one another. You will know then when to cut your losses. Remember to be a caring and empathetic life coach. Your work is to help your clients to reach their goals and to help them see how to achieve them. So this requires somebody who enjoys assisting others and as hard as it might be sometimes, it will take courage and lots of love and patience for this life coaching experience. You will also feel the rewards of success in showing this person that they did it, yay! It's a great feeling for them and for you. Believe me, it's a wonderful, wonderful feeling. Clients will feel like they're your friend. 
you're their friend. And it's very, very important and very clear to maintain professionalism. Do not lend them money. They say they will pay you back, but they won't. Does it sound like I have experience at this? <laughs> oh, yes. Don't do it. No matter how much they cry, how much they beg, believe me, it has never worked out pleasantly. No going to happy hour together either. After a few drinks together, you might just say something that you'll regret as a professional life coach. You just might break character. Also, no dating. Be discreet at lunches. It could be okay if it's for life coaching business. And receiving a gift, well, that is for you to be very careful about also. I will say this again, it is very important to keep professionalism because if you become friends, they will stop paying you. You will not be able to tell them some things like, you really need a haircut, buddy, for this interview. Or your hygiene needs attention because you don't want to hurt your friend's feelings. It is a good practice to keep boundaries very, very clear. Another thing, remember to keep a clear list or file of resources with addresses, updated phone numbers, people's names. Become familiar with those people that could give you information that could come in handy in helping your clients, like where they can go for food stamps assistance where they can go for basic public assistance, food banks. There are also inter agencies where they can go and apply for gas funds. This way they won't be asking you for money. Clinics for free dental assistance and they will help you with emergency toothaches. Shelter homes. YMCA has resources to help people in need. Everything you can gather or put together in a convenient file. It is my experience I can you can always get a list of resources from the Chamber of Commerce located in your area. Well, our time together has come to an end right now. And if you are serious about becoming a life coach, please contact stpaulsforuniversity.com or you can contact me, Rosa M. Luna, at rosamluna.com. Thank you so much for listening. This was fun. Take care. You are here and the world needs you now more than ever. Today is the day you start making a massive difference in the world. There's no doubt. If you ask around, you'll get buy-in to the idea that these are the worst of times. But I have news for you. That is a lie. Nothing is further from the truth. There is hope. Where is the hope? The hope is in you. You are the light shining in the darkness. You didn't get here by any accident. You came here to this place at this time on purpose, on target. This is you at the perfect time, the perfect place in your life. Your life has not been a bread of roses. Why do you think that is? Your life, every misstep, every shortfall, every tragedy, every tear, every broken heart or tarnished heart, all of the chaos, all the confusion, all the agony, the pain, everything brought you here to this perfect moment in time when everything changes now. I'm David M. Masters, Transfiguration Specialist and Lead Coach Trainer at St. Paul's Free University. These are my babies and their babies, less my latest baby, which just came to join us. I'd show you a picture of her, but I don't have a signed models release yet, so. I'm working on that. I am the author of the Life Coach textbook, founder of the Olympian Life Coach School, and yes, I am the original Olympia Life Coach. It is my responsibility to verify that everyone who gets certified today has a basic skill set to be an effective personal life coach, and I have no doubt that you are the right people for the job. I have the sense that you are specially qualified to be a spectacular life coach starting today, and I'm here to vouch for you but you're going to have to convince me that you've got what it takes. If you've lived a charmed life with no drama, no trauma, and life has been just rosy for you, then no problems whatsoever, you could probably do better. If you're here today 
and you've had to live some life, and you know what I mean. I mean, you've seen the dark side. You've lived it. You know what it's like to have loved and lost. You know what it's like to have trusted and been betrayed. You've given your heart and suffered for it. And if you've ever wondered why, why have you risked it all and suffered for it? Today is the answer. You have the highest degree of life training. Who better to be a personal life coach than someone who has been there? Someone who has been in the trenches. Someone who has looked the devil in the eye and lived to tell the story about it. I believe you have what it takes, but you're going to have to have 10 basic qualities to rock as a personal life coach who can help inspire others who need your help to get to the other side. Number one, confidentiality. Number two, tolerance, means no judgment. Number three, active listener. Number four, supportive. Number five, adaptive. Number six, willing to learn. Number seven, filtered empathy. Number eight, identify goals. Number nine, accountability partner. And number 10, integrity and honor. Let's take a closer look at these attributes. Number one, confidentiality. I started my tenure as a life coach in the ministry. So maintaining confidentiality was my primary function. To encourage people to achieve their highest and best while being their trusted confidant. When you're on a path that diverges from the path that would otherwise be your natural default, you need someone you can lean on, someone you can trust. Why? Because no one knows better than everyone watching right now that you can't trust anyone. Not your family, not your spouse, not your best friend, but you better damn well be able to trust the priest or your coach. That's for damn sure. If you're going to be a coach, you owe it to yourself, your clients, and your community, and the world to protect your clients' privacy and honor their daring to be open and honest with you because you know you need someone you can trust. And today, that person who can be trusted is you. Raise your hand and repeat after me. I am a personal life coach. I maintain the highest confidence. with my clients. They can tell me secrets. And I keep their secrets with them. I honor and protect their ability to express themselves openly and honestly in this sacred environment for I am a personal life coach thank you for playing today the scribes got that confidentiality check number two is tolerance that means no judgment what is tolerance in the coaching environment which we set aside as sacred space that you share with your client you establish and understand this is not about you and your life. The coaching relationship is about your client and his or her life, not you and yours. That means everything that happens in this sacred space represents your client's world, your client's universe, which could be very different from the world and the universe that you live in. And that's okay. There's no judgment in this coaching space. If your client says, that's the way it is, then you honor that and you agree with them. That's the way it is. And you don't say something condescending like, well, that's the way it is for you. No, there's no judgment here. You let it be, let them be, whatever it is. You've got their back. Everyone agree? Tolerance, check. Number three, active listener. You're not here to lecture your clients, tell them how it's going to be, 
or how their life is supposed to be. It's your job to listen. Now I admit, when I was first active in the ministry, there was a lot more leading and a bit of judgment in my coaching because I was young, ambitious, and naive. I mean, all I wanted back then was for my Heavenly Father to be proud of me. I wanted to do Him proud because I wanted Him to love me. I mean, I wasn't getting that kind of love anywhere else, so I just did the best I could with what I had. And no one should judge you for doing the best you can with what you have. So what does it mean to be an active listener? It means you listen to your client tell his or her story. You repeat back what he or she says in your own words. And let him or her know you understand. And if they don't think you've got it, they can qualify with what they said until you get a firm grasp of it. And you ask them questions about what they were talking about and give them space to elaborate. Now you're actively listening and you're hearing what they have to say. Are you willing to listen actively? Check. Number four, supportive. And you're hell of supportive. Yeah, you just don't just listen. You can encourage them, challenge them, dare them to look at their situation of circumstance from a different perspective. You can get them to think outside the box by asking them what if questions. You can gently persuade them to move in a positive direction, but you will never tell them what to do. Why? Common sense. This absolves you from any responsibility. I mean, your clients will never be able to say, my coach made me do it. And what if one of your clients did try to blame you for some action that they took, which came with dire consequences? You can, with the clearest of conscience, say, I never tell my clients what to do. I am 100% committed to supporting my clients and what they do without judgment. And your practice is clear indicator that your word is good. Repeat after me. I never tell my clients what to do. I am 100% committed to supporting my clients and what they do without judgment, period. Supportive? Check. Number five, adaptive. You don't have to think about yourself as a chameleon. But you must have the ability to walk a mile in your client's shoes. Most life coaches have a degree of empathy and find it fairly easy to imagine what it would be like to be in the shoes of their clients. Being adaptive goes hand in hand with being tolerant. You want to be able to adjust your environment, your sacred space, to be the most supportive for your client. At the very least, for the time you're creating space for your client to do their personal work. I like what St. Paul had to say about being adaptive. He said, I am become all things to all men, that by all means I might save some. That's 1 Corinthians 9.22. It doesn't mean you compromise who you are at all. It means you're willing to take the back seat in the effort for someone else to excel. Can you do that? And do not worry. You will not have to be stuck there. After your client is left, you can clean yourself and the area to ready for the next unique client or environment to be attracted to you and your area of expertise. The upside of being highly adaptive for me is to share experiences with my clients which I would never have had the chance to share, not in a million years or a thousand lifetimes. Repeat after me. I am highly adaptive, willing to take the back seat, for the benefit of my client, I am compassionate when my client is struggling and celebrate his or her wins, enthusiastically the wins. Adaptive? Check. Number six, willing to learn. The path of the personal life coach is one of constant and never-ending improvement. 
This is a full tilt, non-stop learning environment. If you're good, you'll be learning from your clients. You'll be learning from your peers and other coaches who share communities with you. It is also generally accepted that life coaches are earning at least 15 credit hours a year to help hone your skills and remain plugged in to your professional coaching network and philosophy. In fact, we're setting up a Facebook group for all you coaches coming on board here today. We will be sending you an invite to join the group. Now this is also a safe environment and you agree that when you are using this group you are doing so to exchange information and ask for input that concerns you, your clients, and your coaching business. This is not a dating site. It's moderated and strictly for your coaching needs, concerns, and growth as a personal life coach. Are you willing to learn? Everyone who is willing to learn, say yes. Anyone not? The yeses have it. Check. Number seven, filtered empathy. Okay, we've established that most people who feel a calling to the coaching therapeutic sciences lean toward the empathetic side. This can lead to being vulnerable due to your sensitivities to certain circumstances or emotional vibrations. You have to promise me that you will look after your empathetic persuasions and protect yourself. I will share a secret phrase with you that I hope you will find useful for your tendency to get lost in empathy. Ready? Repeat after me. I care, but not too much. Now I know that sounds crazy. It's something you never want to say in front of your client. This is only for you and the perseverance of your psyche. You have to look after yourself for damn sure no one else is going to look after you. So if you're going to make this your business, you need to filter your empathy so that it does not consume you. Learn to care, but not too much. Another thing that was very helpful for me was to learn Reiki, which was very interesting to me. I discovered Reiki with other Olympia life coaches that I was working with who were promoting their energy healing. And I was like, what is that? Since life coaches are all seekers of continuing education, away I went. And one of the most valuable things I learned from Reiki trainings was how to channel energy. And I was able to apply that to my coaching practice by allowing my clients energy to flow right through me and not get stuck inside my body. Getting that negative energy of others is a problem that empaths have, right? So looking into Reiki might be something that you might like to check out. Repeat after me. I care, but not too much. And number eight, identify goals. When you think of a coach, you probably don't think of all that other stuff but this. Helping your client identify, set, and reach goals in a successive order to get them from where they are to where they want to be. That's what you think coaching is all about. And that is the primary reason that someone seeks out a life coach in the first place. I mean you're so busy hacking your way through the dense forest with a machete that it's hard to focus on the concise strategic markers or milestones that keep you on track. And before you know it, you're saying, oh, look, I found a path. Someone else is already cut out for me. And it's not long and you figure out that someone was you and you realize you've been going around in circles. That's never going to get you where you want to be. So they come to you. You have the aerial view and you can help them chart a course. Will you help your clients identify and chart out their goals? Not your ideas of the goals that you think they should set, but those you help them define for themselves. Will you do that? Okay. Identify goals? Check. Number nine, accountability partner. What is an accountability partner? At Olympia Life Coach, there are many types of coaches, counselors, and consultants. 
and most of the practitioners there would be glad to have you come in and complain about your life for a hundred bucks and it's worth it you got to let off some steam with someone who has your back I mean they're not gonna judge you or rat you out but come next week or your next visit well life is just the same old same old and you want to pay someone to listen as an Olympian life coach it's not all about making yourself feel better after talking about the way things are no it's about personal growth and change and a desire to reach a degree of competence and excellence in your life so here's a little trick I learned from Mark Victor Hansen which increased my productivity as a coach exponentially it's that we do this together step by step that means when you come in here and meet in my office it's on playtime is over by the end of the session you're gonna have homework we're gonna identify goals and establish a laundry list of items for you to have checked off by your next meeting and I'll expect you to move and I will move with you ready to walk alongside of you as you're ready to take the next step but if you don't step if you're not kicking ass and taking names I'm gonna refer you to one of my associates because of who I am I only work with the movers and shakers the people like you who are out there doing the work who dare to achieve your highest and best those unique individuals who want to live a better life your best life and make the world a better place now you can have any kind of therapist you want but if you want to make a difference in the world and you can keep up not with me but with yourself being respectful of you and who you are doing it right by you we can talk and we'll see how it goes step for step you and me are you willing to raise the bar and be an accountability partner for your clients last and most importantly integrity and honor you are going to be true to you first then you are going to have a relationship with your clientele that's based on the highest degree of integrity and honor so what is integrity they say that integrity is doing the right thing when no one is watching you which is true but it's more than that if you operate in integrity everyone knows what to expect from you you have an established pattern of behavior that is solid and people rely on you to be who you are in almost any circumstance and it's doing the right thing whether anyone is watching or not and honor honor is representing the ethical standards which come with holding the lives of others in your hands as a coach you could be hugely influential but that's not your job your job is to challenge and support your clients you could influence or manipulate your client to do whatever you want him or her to do but you don't do that you don't allow weird relationships or fantasies to flourish and by all means do not cross boundaries of romance or intimacy with your client believe it or not this comes up often in the types of coaching relationships where you're doing your best to help someone else achieve their highest and best they're not used to someone caring about them that way and they can misinterpret your supportive actions as love and of course you do love your clients but not in a romantic way so be aware of where your relationship is going keep it professional and if you're not able to keep your clients romantic interests in you at bay then refer them to another coach conduct your practice with honor for if you don't it could be detrimental to the services you're trying to offer raise your hand and repeat after me I promise not to have sex with my clients I will operate my coaching efforts in a professional manner with integrity and honor good job check now that's all 10 attributes go forth embrace your talents and gifts use the lessons you've learned from your past and help others achieve their highest and best encouraging them while empowering yourself to live a better life your best life and make the world a better place if you want to make a career of your life coaching practice there are opportunities available with my friends at st. Paul's for University or you are certainly welcome to contact me 
I am David M. Masters, and you can find out more about me at davidmmasters.com. Now you've received your temporary certification in our workbooks here today that you've downloaded. I'm going to tell you how to get your official personalized certificate mailed to you that is suitable for framing and you will be proud to use it to start your new profession as a personal life coach. You will also get continuing education units for completing this class. If you feel like your life's calling includes being a powerful life coach, I'd like to invite you to join us for the Olympian Life Coach Masterclass. It's an immersive 10-week masterclass. In 10 weeks, you'll become a certified Olympian Life Coach and raise your life coaching skills and activities to be head and shoulders above the other coaches out there today. Life coaching is the fastest growing professional segment in the United States. And if you desire to be successful, you can do so by taking a proactive professional approach to increasing your efficacy and coaching acumen. As a certified Olympian life coach, you will be able to increase your ability to powerfully help people while being greatly remunerated for your efforts as you make the world a better place. There is little more that is as satisfying as helping others achieve their highest and best. The Olympian Life Coach Certification is the most comprehensive coaching certification which empowers Olympian Life Coaches to in effect create miraculous, life-changing results in their clients. As an Olympian Life Coach, you become a powerful force for good in the world and align with others who are truly participating in the evolution of humanity at an important time in our planet's history. The world is changing at a rapid pace, and Olympian Life Coaches are on the leading edge of the growth and expansion necessary to keep up with this evolutionary process. The course includes everything you need from how to run your business to fulfilling your Olympian Life Coach toolbox with tools from a wide spectrum of therapeutic science. Your Olympian Life Coach certification is internationally recognized by professionals, businesses, government agencies, and the top corporations all over the world. The Olympian Life Coach Masterclass has been around for many years and is a living, growing, and expanding program. Every year, the course changes to be the most up-to-date and relevant life coach training program in the now. The tips, tools, techniques, and therapeutic modalities you learn in the Olympian Life Coach Masterclass are priceless, and it would cost you thousands of dollars and take years of training to have access to all these different modalities. Yet, as an Olympian Life Coach partnering with St. Paul's Free University, you have access to all of this and more right out of the gate. Plus, you're joining a network of other Olympian Life Coaches to help expand your capabilities. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Olympian Life Coaches have a private group community where open communication and support takes place amidst Olympian Life Coaches. So, if you run into a difficult client, no problem. Share your challenges with other coaches and ready your client for massive breakthroughs as they make it to the next level. And every time you use the resources, such as the private group and the community, the course grows and expands. If it's time to increase your coaching skills and potential while increasing credibility and profitability amidst your professional coaching practice, then the Olympian Life Coach Masterclass is for you. Now, this is a $5,000 course of study, but if you sign up today and you've received your free personal life coach certification during the COVID-19 lockdown, St. Paul's Free University is giving you a $4,000 coronavirus scholarship. That's an 80% savings off the regular price. That's right. During the lockdown, you pay only $1,000 or make $100 payments each week for 10 weeks. This can be the most important step you can take to live a better life, your best life, and make the world a better place as you achieve your highest and best and help others to do the same. And for our alumni out there, has it been a while since you initially took our Olympian Life Coach training and certification? No problem. You can retake the master class at special alumni pricing and get full continuing education credits, CEUs to refresh your skills and abilities 
and to expand your possibilities by having access to all the latest updates. We are starting the classes here, online, for the Olympian Life Coach Masterclass. If you have completed this personal life coach certification, you can sign up here at stpaulsfreeuniversity.com slash OLCM slash OLCM stands for Olympian Life Coach Masterclass. So that's stpaulsfreeuniversity.com slash OLCM. And congratulations to you for taking this important step today and add value to your community and helping in making the world a better place. To receive your official personal life coach certification and CEU credits for attending this class, including your certificate suitable for framing, free, at no cost to you, sign up online at stpaulsfreeuniversity.com slash PLCC. That's slash PLCC which stands for Personal Life Coach Certification. That's stpaulsfreeuniversity.com slash PLCC. It's free, and you will receive your official certification delivered to you in the mail. And remember, if you want to take the Olympian Life Coach Masterclass with us at 80% off, you can sign up for that at stpaulsfreeuniversity.com slash OLCM stands for Olympian Life Coach Masterclass. stpaulsuniversity.com slash OLCM. If you have any questions, you can reach out to any of our presenters here today or contact us through St. Paul's Free University or our Facebook group. I am David M. Masters, and I'm grateful for your attendance and your participation during these unprecedented times. You can contact me at davidmmasters.com and thank you for attending and helping us to help others as a personal life coach. Congratulations and good day.